It, is, it really is a pleasure to introduce our panelists this morning. They are doing amazing work in the area of democracy. Um, Lauren Stilker Rickling um, is an attorney. She's the president of Rickling Institute for Strategic Leadership and the interim executive director of Lawyers Defending American Democracy. Now, Lauren has explained to us that that role as interim executive director is a full-time, part-time job. Uh, as she will tell you, the Lawyers Defending American Democracy has taken action in a number of cases to enforce the ethical obligations of attorneys and others to protect democracy. She's got a book coming out in February. We had hope to have flyers about it, but that's our fault, not hers, that we don't have them. But um, keep your eye out for it, please. It's called Her Honor, Stories of Challenge and Triumph from Women Judges. How about that, Judge White? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, Lauren will be joined on the panel by Erica Newland. Erica is counsel with the organization called Protect Democracy. Protect Democracy is a cross-ideological nonprofit group dedicated to promoting free and fair elections, regardless of who wins, defending the rule of law against authoritarian threats, and preventing disinformation from corrupting fact-based debate. Erica's work, I think, focuses on presidential election reform, um, Department of Justice reform, and securing accountability for abuses of power. Before taking her current position, she served as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, and before that, um, actually served as an offer to the Honorable Merrick Garland on the U.S. Court of Appeals, the D.C. Circuit. Um, she was, she's also a senior policy analyst at the Center for Democracy and Technology. So, um, let me start off by asking both of you, and I'm going to sit on this table, my apologies, if <laughs> Dean Hutchinson comes in, please somebody tell me. Um, <laughs> do, let me start with asking each of you, um, we are working on the premise, I guess, that lawyers do have some special responsibility to protect democracy. Um, so do you see that as a premise that you work from? And if so, what do you see as the role of lawyers in this arena? And you can, whoever wants to can start. Sure. Um, it, so y the answer is a wholehearted yes. That's why we're called lawyers defending American democracy. And the fundamental um, founding was from uh, a group of lawyers from a, a law school reunion who were um, led by a Massachusetts former two-time attorney general um, talking about how could it be, and this was in 2018, uh, how could it be that lawyers are staying so silent when there are so many attacks on democracy and the rule of law taking place right now? And um, that conversation led to the founding of Lawyers Defending American Democracy, but the entire premise is based on the fact that we have a special and unique role in a nonpartisan, nonpolitical way to protect our democratic institutions. And that's what we all must be doing, and that's what we strive to, to do every day. And I hope we can have a conversation today, and I'd love to hear from other people about why has the legal profession as a whole stayed so silent um, at a time when our institutions are at such risk around us. And why aren't bar associations across the country, why isn't the academy speaking up in greater numbers? Why are our law firms who are doing so well staying so silent and so in institutional ways um, when we are facing so many threats? So it's fundamental. Erica, your thoughts? I agree wholeheartedly. I say hi, thank you for having me. Um, and to say I have a young baby at home and I'm recovering from a bad cold, so I'm going to show my face briefly to say <laughs> hi and then, and then mask back up. Um, with apologies for that. Um, you know, I, lawyers are custodians of our democracy. We've been trained in the tools that have been used to undermine that democracy, frankly, and uphold that democracy over the past 200 years and 200 plus years. And I think we're the co custodians of the aspiration, which of course we've never fully realized as a country, um, that those in power need to be held uh, accountable and must use that power in accordance with the law. And um, you know, everyone in this country is a, is a custodian of that principle, but um, lawyers have the craft and the tool to really help enforce that. Um, uh, and people look to us to know when a line is crossed, the press certainly does. And so we have to, I think, speak out to help guide everyone um, 
to, to know when those lines have been crossed. And um, that's part of what, what Protect Democracy does. Let, let me just drill down, and I'm sitting down even though I'd much rather stand up. <laughs> I've been told I have to use the microphone or the recording equipment won't work properly. So that's why I've been relegated to sitting. Um, but anyway, I, I would like to drill down with each of you a little more on your organizations. Um, Lauren, I know that the Lawyers Defending American Democracy um, has, for instance, on its website, and they, yes, they both have very great websites, go look at them, um, but you have the democracy commitment that you ask people to sign, not just people, lawyers. Um, can you talk about that for a minute? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, so, Again, on the premise that we as a profession are uniquely positioned um, we, to help the public understand what is happening and to be able to promote civil discourse. Um, what we have done is we've asked lawyers to sign what we call the democracy commitment in which lawyers would, in signing, be asserting that they are willing um, to exercise leadership within the profession um, and within their own communities and to address um, just four fundamental uh, core principles. And I'll just say them really quickly. One having to do, and, and these are, you know, as we drill down, these are pretty basic things that we should all be, um, you know, wanting to help with. Uh, public discourse must take place in an atmosphere that promotes civility and robust debate and rejects threats and intimidation. We all can understand why that's one of the core principles in light of what's been happening since 2020. Threats, intimidation, or violence aimed at government officials or political candidates at any level or at members of the media are threats to our democracy and warrant a response from the legal profession. The third, participation in free and fair elections administered by officials with no stake in the outcome is the most fundamental right we have as Americans and must be protected. And the last thing is that each member of the electorate must be treated with dignity and have equal and unfettered access to the vote. And I think you can understand why those are the four that were selected. Again, nonpartisan, non-political uh, goals to um, that we are asking lawyers to use their skills in whatever way works within their community, in their state, in their neighborhood, to be able to address these kind of principles. Um, it's all there on it's uh, ldad.org, um, and I'm happy to talk more at length, but I want to turn it Back to you and keep the conversation going. <laughs> let, me, let me ask Erica. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that both of these organizations are new. Both were created by attorneys. And why do you think it was necessary for the organizations to be created? And um, what's the void? that's being filled. Yeah, so, so there are a lot of great democracy organizations out there. We partner with them all the time. Uh, what the found, I joined Protect Democracy in 2019, um, came from the Department of Justice, as, as you mentioned. Um, but when, when, the organ, when Protect Democracy was founded in 2017, our founders looked around and said, there's an authoritarian threat. You know, we, we used to joke that it was the A word because it was kind of uncomfortable to say that before January 6th when we had this kind of made for TV version of everything that had been undermining our democracy for the past four years. And of course, the kind of those forces had been had been active for a long time. Um, and and we need an integrated approach to, um, to fighting those authoritarian threats. And integrated in two senses. One, in terms of integrated advocacy. We use litigation, we use policy advocacy, we engage with the press a lot, we engage at the state and the federal level. So, so integrated in terms of, of means, but also integrated in terms of ends. So, you know, it's about protecting our elections, but it's also about restoring our guardrails to ensure that there are checks on executive power. Uh, it's about um, ensuring that disinformation does not undermine our ability to self-govern, um, that dissent is not quashed, um, that vulnerable communities are not delegitimized, uh, and that our independent institutions are not politicized. So, you know, I think the founders really saw an opportunity, and lawyers in particular being well positioned to speak with authority and to use some of those tools. Lawyers can do policy advocacy. Um, lawyers can talk to the press, but um, you know, someone without a law degree can't can't stand up in court unless I think you're in California. <laughs> but it's certainly not here. Um, so so that's why why we were necessary. So well, both of your organizations were created by attorneys. Um, are attorneys still the primary drivers behind both of them? Oh, for us, certainly, um, it, uh, 
all, everybody who's involved in, in LDAD is a lawyer. And the, the reason is, again, going back to the basic principle, not only of our responsibility, but of the fact that we have special capacity to be able to address the kinds of challenges that we are trying to address. So um, our volunteers, our lawyers, our, um, our board are all lawyers, and but we also <coughs> hope to be reaching you know, the community at large in trying to help affect change, but it's through the voice of attorneys. And for us, we still have a lot of lawyers at our organization, um, but we have also really broadened to, you know, I mentioned before some of the different moving parts. We also have technologists to help us understand what's going on with voter rolls and help election officials, you know, make sure that their voter rolls are, are safe and secure. Um, but I don't think we could do the work that we do as an organization without lawyers, of course, just as in-house general counsel, but also in terms of, um, in terms of speaking with authority about what's going on. Um, and if I can give one example, you know, one, um, in addition to some really successful litigation we have, which, we've had, which I'm happy to talk about, with, about later, we've also organized lawyers to, um, to put their names out there um, on behalf of important rule of law principles. So during the um, previous administration, we would have you know, a thousand, I think at one point, over a thousand former Department of, Ju uh, Department of Justice, US Department of Justice attorneys, um, signing letters saying um, you know, a line has been crossed here or Congress needs to investigate this. Um, uh, for example, it's like the Lafayette Square and, um, and the Comey investigation, things like that. Um, so uh, only lawyers, I think, can speak, can speak with that authority. And um, our understanding is that that moved the ball in some important ways with respect to it. Well, I was going to ask you that. So you have a lot of lawyers yeah. sign a letter like that. Who yeah. does it go to? And what does it accomplish? So um, usually it goes to um, whoever gets the exclusive <laughs> at the Washington Post or the New York Times. Um, and um, I think that sets a, um, it sets a bar, it sets a narrative. When I say that you know, lawyers have the legitimacy, um, I, I don't think I can overstate enough how in the, like, in the narrative around what is happening in our country, you have the, um, you have the mediators of that narrative, which is usually the press, um, asking lawyers, is this crossing a line or is this just politics as normal? And when a thousand lawyers who, as Lauren has spoke to, are so lowercase c conservative in nature, often fearful of speaking out, you know, we can, um, you know, to borrow from Thurgood Marshall, you know, we can play ostrich sometimes a little too much. Um, when we put our names on the line against folks in power and say a thousand of us institutionalists see something really, really wrong here, um, folks pay attention and that narrative shifts and that narrative trickles down and it all sounds kind of mushy um, for lawyers who like like getting like orders from courts and injunctions. Um, but I think I think it matters in, in the direction that our politics and our government moves. Let me pick up on something you just said because it does seem to an outsider at least to be a bit of a generational difference between your organizations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Lauren, your your organization seems to be powered mostly by older lawyers and people like me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of visible right here, I'm just going to say. And, and then Erica, it, at least for, to an outsider, it looks like um, Protect Democracy is, is populated in large part by younger lawyers. Am I right about that? And, and what, do you, what do you think is the genesis of that? Either one of you want to take that? I mean, I'm, I can say for L, uh, LDAP's part. Um, so L, um, Lawyers Defending American Democracy was founded by a group at a, um, a 50th reunion. No, and, no I was my not case. there <laughs> at Harvard Law School. So I'm neither from Harvard Law School nor have reached that milestone. Um, but so that's its, its genesis. And, um, you know, what we found that it was that um, there is there are a lot of lawyers who are um, at a point in their career where they are thinking about legacy, thinking about meaning, and thinking about what, what did I do with my career? How can I put some, 
you know, meaning behind what I have done and what I intend to do with my with my time left. So I think that is a huge driver of, of the kinds of volunteers that we attract and those of us who are um, engaged and, and involved. So it, it, I think it just became a natural um, evolution, I think, out of its founding. So we um, hear from younger people all the time, of course, and that's always wonderful, but that's just its seeds. And I, I, I think that for senior lawyers, we are at a moment in particular to say, what do I want my legacy to be when, I'm, when I have this gift and these skills at a time when our democracy is in such danger? Eric, am I right about protect democracy? We, we do tend to skew young. Um, that may just be a, a kind of accidental function of, of our founders. We're also a very family-friendly organization. Um, I'm currently on uh, week 10 of 18 weeks of parental leave, um, so I advertise that great policy. Um, uh, but, um, but we work in partnership with lawyers across generation and, are, and lean especially hard on those um, more senior, more experienced lawyers, um, because again, they have the authority, um, they have the networks, um, and they have the tools, they've seen things, they've, they've been in the battlefield. Um, and so it really, we are, doing, we are engaging in these cross-generational uh, partnerships um, literally every, work, every working day. Um, but it is harder, I guess, you know, it is harder for um, younger attorneys to do what the lawyers at Lawyers Defending American Democracy are doing, I think, or to sign their names to letters um, or uh, speak out, because they f we tend to feel less um, secure in our place within the profession. And I think you know, Lauren and I share share many things in common. What one one that we share is. Um, believing that by, and I hope we can kind of talk about this more, but by, through mentorship, through, um, through empowering younger attorneys to feel supported in speaking out, um, we can help enable them to take the steps necessary to protect our democracy. No one's going to do it alone. If we know anything for the past two and a half years, we are social creatures, and we need social support and social support systems to, to do the right thing. If I could yes, just add to that, because I do think it is so, it, it, one thing you said, uh, in terms of, um, for example, when you do, um, we also do calls to action where we seek lots of um, lawyer signatures in support of things. Sometimes we've even done it on the um, uh, ethical complaints that we've done. Um, one of the things I, um, I've gotten in the habit of looking at when, you know, if, if we get a thousand, several thousand, whatever it is, signatures for whatever, what that particular call to action, for example, I'll scan the list of those who sign, and still, it breaks my heart in one respect. I'm thrilled that many have signed it, but the other piece of it are retired judge, retired judge, retired lawyer, retired lawyer. And yet, as well-networked as we are as an organization, the people are, that are involved, we are former bar presidents for, from the American Bar, me and the Boston Bar, where um, former partners in major firms and other firms around the country. We've been led major um, nonprofit organizations, government organizations, and yet, and yet, with all that network, those people who are signing are people who are already out of their organizations and their institutions. And that does drive me crazy. You're not getting the managing partners of we the are big not. <laughs> <laughs> They are not. Well, Erica, Erica, let me let me ask you to follow up on that a little bit because I know from our conversations that you went through a whole decision-making process, and you are at a point in your career where you have maybe a little more at risk than some of those retired law firm partners. Um, can we dig into your ethical considerations and struggles that you went through in making your decision? Absolutely. So, um, you know, as Natalie mentioned, I. Um, after I finished clerking for then Judge Garland, I joined the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice, and this was um, summer of 2016. Um, so, you know, frankly, I had a certain vision of what the next few years would bring, and that is that is not uh, kind of where the country was headed. And um, when uh, when the election happened, I had a lot of colleagues who were looking for their next move, um, but for me, I felt a real compulsion to stay. 
um, you know, whatever the politics of the next administration um, and the statements that the president-elect had said that seemed very anti-democracy to me. Um, I felt like, you know, as lawyers, we have to stay and make sure the rule of law is followed and carried out. That is our sacred obligation. I encourage my colleagues to stay. Um, and through, I spent two years there. Through that period, I felt like I had um, an opportunity to make a difference. I felt like I had maneuvering room. You know, I, I was low enough down that, like, you know, Trump wasn't going to be tweeting about me. You know, I, I had no one was going to be murdering my family. Um, you know, we, we weren't at that stage of authoritarianism. Um, um, I believe I had an ability to make a difference given the office I was in, and I felt like staying and trying to be an example to my colleagues. Of you know we're under a lot of political pressure as an office um, to do things that are uh, frankly racist, unlawful, um, uh, very disturbing in a lot of ways. Um, but we can use the tools of our craft um, to make sure that the great ship of state is continuing uh, to follow the law, um, uh, and and we can avoid the effect of this trap, which is the idea. Um, this is coined during the Vietnam era that um, you keep holding out for when it's worth it to stand up and you never actually stand up and do the right thing because you're always waiting for, for that time that it's actually worth it. Um, uh, and then what happened um, was I eventually felt like I couldn't, could no longer convince myself that I had a great sense of up versus down. You know, because as attorneys, we can't talk about what we're doing with folks outside the office. And so those typical support systems um, that you go to to say, am I crazy? Like, this seems really bad, but, but maybe I'm missing something. No, you're just inside this little bubble. And that bubble was getting smaller and smaller. Um, and I felt like I kind of used up all of my capital. I'd spoken up as much as I could. And so I left and I begged my colleagues to stay. Um, I promise this story ends soon. Um, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I enjoy Protect Democracy, and, um, and then the 2020 election rolls around. And what I see is, um, I see, you know, Trump's attorneys standing up in court. These are not government attorneys. Um, uh, and they can barely litigate. Uh, they don't know, they don't know civil procedure. They're, they're basically lying in the courtroom, and the judges are calling them out, and the judges are saying, the Trump appointed judges are saying we see through this, we are, um, we're not gonna partake in this game anymore. Um, and what, I, what this kind of highlighted for me was the extent to which the work that we as attorneys had been doing was kind of legitimizing um, some of the really terrible things that the administration was doing, even in trying to push, even, you know, Pushing back within, we were still putting our imprimatur on what was happening. People were still looking to us and saying, those reasonable people are still in the government. Things must be OK. Um, and so it really um, really kind of changed my view on, um, on uh, what it means to work, work from the inside and some of the challenges in doing that um, and, and, and getting your timing right on that. I think, you know, uh, Frankly, I think some of the work that we did helped get us to a place where January 6th was possible. Um, and um, I wish that I wish that hadn't hadn't been the case. Um, so uh, I and I guess the the I'll bring it back to the conversation Lauren and I were having, which is um, you know as I've spoken publicly about um, about my experiences. Um, you know, the first thing that is always on my mind is, what do my former colleagues think? How are they hearing this? They were delightful people to work with, um, lovely people um, in, in many respects. And, um, and when I would hear from former colleagues, you know, who would write to me or sometimes say something publicly, um, that I cannot, over, I cannot state enough how impactful that was for me and empowering that was for me. And um, so I would encourage everyone in this room, when you are seeing someone who is um, doing the right thing, uh, uh, you know, talk to them privately or speak up publicly on their behalf. You know, allyship uh, is extraordinarily important. I think we can, uh, we can miss how important that is. So, so even if you don't have the guts to do what you're doing, at least tell the people who do that you admire them for doing it. <laughs> Um, uh, and and that, that, I think, is true across, across all walks of life. So I, I, I want to ask both of you this, because um, it's, it's something that 
organizations wrestle with, as you can probably understand. Um, and as a bar association, you know, the, how, how would you suggest that leaders of the profession, um, usually they're in the bar association or other institutions, what would you suggest they do to enable people to speak out more if they see the need to do so? Um, so I have really strong opinions about that as a former bar president and as a very active ABA leader. Um, and uh, I actually, and it, well, the other piece of having being an active bar member and bar leader is that I have also written a book on generational challenges in the workplace and a lot of my other full-time job, in addition to this full-time job, is doing speaking and training on, on workplace culture issues with a particular focus on generational challenges. And I, I have for a long time felt that bar associations are missing the membership challenge. That what we talk about when we talk about our member concerns are our fears of who will leave. That's quantifiable often. Somebody will write a letter and they're all upset. What's not quantifiable is who isn't joining. Who doesn't come to you because you don't stand for anything that they can visualize themselves wanting to expend their precious free time on? And so my feeling is that what, what, what bar associations are missing is the ability to articulate a message that says, we as lawyers have a special duty. We will, we will protect democracy and the rule of law and access to justice and other wonderful things that bars are already doing. Uh, but we will take a more leadership role in that. And we will define our work by the fact that it is nonpartisan and nonpolitical. We won't let others define it for us. That's one of the other bigger problems. We take stands as bars sometimes. The ABA House of Delegates goes through this all the time. Well, you're just a liberal organization because, well, why? You took a stand in favor of a more diverse workplace? Or um, I don't quite get it. But we let others define us as bars. And I think what bar associations have to do is define themselves and define why what they are doing meets the needs, particularly of younger generations who if you look at all the data tells you that they want to find meaning and purpose in their careers and in their lives. And I think bar associations are a wonderful way to give that to to all lawyers, but particularly younger lawyers. Erica, are you active in a bar association? Not especially. <laughs> Why not? I'm a member of MSBA. Um, uh, uh, how, what, I mean, does what Lauren's saying ring true with you? It, it, it does. Um, uh, and I would, I, I think I might kind of take what you're saying and put it in two categories. One is, right, what do you, what does an association stand for, right? Is it kind of consistent with my values? Am I going to help make the world a better place through it? Um, and the other is, um, you know, kind of reflecting on my own experience, I saw a need um, to, uh, for, forms of, uh, for forms of support, and I saw my colleagues had, had needs for support, that I think a bar association might be especially well positioned to help organize. So, um, you know, as I was, um, you know, was within the, the, the federal government, you know, I was saying, you know, is there, you know, looking at things that were coming across my desk and thinking like, is there a problem here? If I were to engage in whistleblower, you know, it through, it through, you know, one of the whistleblower channels, um, you know, I would need an attorney to help me figure that out, um, figure out whether what I'm seeing qualifies um, and how to, how to use those channels in a lawful way. Um, who do I go to for support? I can't, you know, just out of law school, a federal government salary, I can't afford to pay, you know, however many dollars an hour. Um, can I get an initial consultation? Um, am I at legal risk if I talk to someone about X or Y after I leave? And, you know, at what level of generality can I speak about my work without putting myself at legal risk? Um, and then, separate from legal risk, there's professional risk. Am I going to find support within the legal community, or am I going to be a persona non grata? Um, and when you are back in that bubble, 
what you think is I'm gonna be a persona non grata if I ever speak out, if I, if I take my head out of the sand. And so um, I think bar associations are really well positioned to do some of that signaling. Um, we, here's what we stand for. Um, and if you stand for the same thing, we welcome you into our community. And also maybe here are some resources or members who might be willing to, um, to uh, you know, offer some low bono or pro bono legal advice. I just have to say, as, a, as somebody who really is, I, I, I'm not always crazy about the expression, but sort of a bar junkie at heart, <laughs> I've heard like five different things a bar association could do, right? <clears throat> could, could create programming around what, what Erica just said. I mean, you know, I'm thinking like in my bar leader had like, oh, could do this, this, and that, and it, you know, just you could get really enthused about how to be oh, helpful. He's doing the same thing. <laughs> I, I saw other people out here doing the same thing too. Um, I, I saw a couple of people nodding when you when you talked about you know why don't bar associations do that more often and, and why don't they advertise to people um, that this is nonpartisan this is nonpolitical political but this is something lawyers have to do. Um, Cheryl and Eiffel talked with us in, in the first talk a lot about that and pointing out that you know this is not a political issue this is not a partisan issue this is a rule of law issue that we have an obligation to. And following up on that, Lauren, I know that lawyers defending against, I mean, lawyers defending American democracy, um, to get, to drill down a little and get a little more specific, mm -hmm. has, has filed some specific actions um, relative to lawyers who have not, perhaps, upheld the rule of law mm -hmm. or the obligation of lawyers for candor with the tribunal or honesty in their statements. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, Erica kind of teed that up in some respect by talking about uh, the fallout from the, um, for the election, you know, the election deniers uh, in the 2020 election. And our focus has been to look at some of the, those who were, whose work was most egregious in undermining the rule of law and in undermining a free and fair election, who really played major roles um, in um, what we are seeing right now is I think, you know, the election piece of our democracy is most at crisis from people who don't believe in that we can, are capable of having free and fair elections in this country uh, to people who are still actively under, undermining results that they don't like. So we've done, we, we treat our complaints um, as legal briefs. They are meticulously researched. They end up looking like very in-depth legal briefs, um, very heavily based on facts and analysis. They're very rigorous work products. And we have done, um, I think we've, we've done six so far. We're working on a seventh right now. Um, but we, we had, our first one was um, in July of 2020 against the Attorney General, Bill Barr. Um, we then did um, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, the Attorney General in, in Texas, Ken Paxton, um, Jeffrey Clark, John Eastman, and John Cheeseboro, in particular for their roles in you know, undermining the Department of Justice and trying to get the Department of Justice to play a role in undermining the election. Um, or you know, Eastman and Cheeseboro, who really masterminded a lot of the fake elector work. So, um, so that is an ongoing part of what we do. Um, again, a very rigorous part, but we think that lawyer accountability is critical and that, you know, on the one hand, we started out saying how to LDAP, how important it is that lawyers have this major role in protecting democracy, but the flip side is that lawyers who have a role in undermining our democratic principles and the rule of law um, must be held accountable. Is that something that you foresee could be done on a, a wider scale by individual attorneys or groups of attorneys? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I was a couple of things. One is we are not the only organizations that have filed against, uh, you know, we have a unique style and uh, work, way we approach these. Um, there is an entire other organization um, that, is, that is out there who has filed, you know, I can't even count how many they have done, but they just really believe that any lawyer actor involved in any aspect of this 
you know, you know should be the subject of a bar complaint. And, um, and even in the ones that we have done, uh, we get calls all the time from individual lawyers who say, I'm working on a complaint against Giuliani, against Ken Paxton, against whatever. Can you give, a, give me some guidance or help me talk through it? So um, filing an ethics complaint, any one of us can do. Um, it's just that you know, we just bring a particular you know, analysis to our work. Well, um, I can say something about how important I think this this work is. You know, one thing that I saw, um, you know, during my experience uh, at DOJ from you know in 2017, 2018, was that um, folks were going to uh, were going to say yes to an authoritarian president until they felt like their careers could not sustain it anymore. Um, and uh, I think the reason that um, we had a ultimately had a, a, a guess, technically a peaceful transfer of power on January 20th, um, uh, uh, that we survived January 6th as a nation, um, was because some of the lawyers um, at DOJ and in the White House uh, realized that they might get in really big trouble if, um, if they didn't press pause. And um, if we go through this period and what people learn is no, actually they were wrong in that assessment, no one's, no, no lawyers are ever going to get in trouble. Yeah. Um, we're going to be in a much, much worse place the next time we have an authoritarian leading president take over. Um, and I, I just can't state enough how important that accountability work that organizations like LDAD are doing for, for that reason. I think it's, it, it is a pivot point on which our democracy turns. Let, let me turn to, now that you brought that up, Erica, something that I know your organization's done some work on, and that's um, trying to redress the intimidation um, and threat of violence factors that have come to play in some of the election disputes, for lack of a better word. Um, can you talk about that for a second? Um, yeah, um, so uh, we have, um, uh, so you know, in addition to making sure that folks, say, in the White House and the Department of Justice are doing the right thing, we have to make sure that our election workers are able to, um, to count votes um, in a way where they are not targeted or harassed. Um, and of course, this is a, a struggle that, you know, that is as old as this country. Um, I don't want to suggest that it's it's a new struggle, um, uh, and, and one that I suspect many people in this room have been a part of at different points in in their lives. Um, so um, some of you may um, may recall um, the extraordinary testimony of Shay Moss, an election worker from Georgia. She spoke um, before the January 6 Commission, um, uh, and uh, she was she and her mother, uh, Ms. Ruby Freeman, were doing their jobs. Um, uh, when uh, when uh, the President of the United States um, and other people associated with him um, uh, publicly claimed um, that they had uh, worked together to rig the outcome of the 2020 election. And um, this upended their lives. They uh, received death threats, um, faced racist attacks, um, and uh, Far worse, um, and um, they. Uh, this is a, we represent them um, in litigation. You can hear me umming and awing because I'm trying to be very careful about what I say. Lawyers know what it, what it is, so I apologize for um, for the unarticulateness there. Uh, um, but what they, you know, their willingness both to do their jobs, and then in the face of all of these attacks. Um, go forward with litigation, um, put themselves at further risk by testifying and telling the country what they experience, um, is A, unfair to them that they have to carry that burden, and B, hopefully an inspiration, can be an inspiration to others. One of my colleagues um, joined them at the January 6th hearing, they went out to lunch afterwards, and folks were coming up on the street to Shay, hugging her in tears. Um, it was really remarkable how moved folks were by her example. Um, and I think that speaks to, um, to how standing in your circle of power can, um, can really inspire folks. And of course, um, Shay and Ruby received the Presidential Citizens Medal just the other week for their work. Well, and, and in addition to the support of the public, how important do you think it was to them or people like them that lawyers stepped forward to support them and help them to get some remedy for what had happened? Oh, that's such an important point. 
they would not have any access to remedy without the support of lawyers um, who are willing to uh, willing to represent them um, to affirm what they did, and other election workers who are trying to decide whether to stay on the job. We've seen record number retirements. Um, need to know that if, God forbid, something happened to them, they will have the support that they need. And that's another place where organizations like bar associations can come and help folks know that, you know, if they just even keep their head down and do the right thing that, that they've been doing for generations and something goes off the rails, um, at least their lives may be upended, but at least, you know, they won't end up bankrupt because of it. You know, I think that's kind of the least we can do for folks who are um, trying to do their duty for our democracy. I know we're getting close to the end of our allotted time, so I wanted to leave time. I know you've both agreed to take questions mm -hmm. from our participants, so I'm going to open the floor up if there are any questions. Anybody want to ask of either Eric or Lauren or their organizations? Dave Panzer. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just a, a question about um, just if, if you have observations about any tension. I see that the name of the panel is Guardians of Justice, and then what you've talked about is guarding democracy. And um, a tension uh, between those two ideals or two goals um, where especially in the in the and you've also talked about the importance of kind of maintaining organizational nonpartisanship or certain kinds of non ideological focus that's it seems like that's increasingly difficult like the 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 there's a narrowing of the zone in which we can agree to disagree or or we can agree that people of goodwill may disagree on hot button issues and i'm just curious about whether like how you it, it, if you see that as well, and how you might um, cope with that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's obviously we're in a delicate space because the um, we're, we're going to do the first part, the, the justice and, and protecting democracy. I mean, to me, they're utterly compatible. Um, you can't have a justice system. Um, if if you're if you don't have a democracy, you it, they they are married forever, and uh, they depend on one another. And what we saw and and continue, you know, what, what we saw certainly with the undermining of the Department of Justice, just how dangerous that can be, and with undermining election workers and in, in, in attacking the um, the right to vote. So. Uh, or really undermining the right to vote. So they, they, to me, they are all of a piece. Um, and I think that the, it, I try to differentiate the difference between these broad legal principles that we have to protect and how you might feel politically about something. I kind of feel like as a country, we are so past, like I, I long for the days when I could just disagree with somebody's politics. I feel like instead I'm running away or trying to deal with a house on fire. And how do you put that fire out? And so I, 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 it's almost as though what used to be considered a partisan divide because I may believe in one thing and you believe in another thing and, and whatever, that's just so beyond, we're so beyond that right now in trying to protect fundamental institutions. And that's why I feel so comfortable about it being outside of partisanship uh, and, and it being non-political. Now the reality is, look, the elephant in the room is the elephant in the room. There is a party right now that is, you know, that, we're, that you know, when you look at who, who we brought these um, uh, complaints against it, what's been going on the last four years. Um, I just, my reaction to that is I just sort of have to shrug, and I know in my heart it wouldn't matter to me which party it was, I would be doing the same thing. So I, I just, and that's why I always try to come back to, I'm not gonna let somebody else define the argument. I know what I, what I believe is right about what it takes to have a functional democracy. 
And I have to remove the party considerations from that, and as I think we all do. I, I hope that helps answer it. I don't know. Hey, I, I love the framing of you can't let someone else define mm -hmm. you know your values for you. Um, one um, piece of literature that I constantly return to um, is the writing of Hannah, Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. And you know, she, of course, was a scholar of the decline into authoritarianism. And um, it, to depths that I hope we will, we will not see um, uh, in our lifetimes. Um, and she wrote really eloquently about one of the phenomena that occurs is up becomes down and down becomes up. And at, at, at the most extreme, she wrote about, I want to be careful not to draw direct analogies here, but the most extreme, she wrote about how soldiers um, in, in the German army during World War II would learn that to shoot children was the right thing to do. And you had to like, your, your heart was telling you no, and your heart had to be retrained not to. Um, and and that, that, was the, um, that was the hard work. And I think it is a reminder that um, uh, a reminder not to let others define for us what we know to be right and what we know to be wrong. And um, and as lawyers, we take an obligation to the Constitution, um, and uh, and that we have to um, that and you know encompassed in that concepts such as free and fair elections. Um, and, um, and we have an obligation to work to uphold the laws and, and the constitutional principles, um, even when, when partisanship seems to, um, uh, seems to suggest that, that that's a partisan thing to do. It's not. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, there's so many questions, so I'm trying to see if I can be articulate. One thing that makes me crazy is how, and the New York Times has these, um, sessions with folks and last Sunday they had it with all these Republicans who said nothing about January 6th changed their minds. <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> Any thoughts about how we as, I'm one of these retired lawyer types, um, can, where can we go to try to dispel the big lie where we actually might be listened to by the people who still believe it? I mean, is anyone in your, I mean, I know you're nonpartisan, so are, is anyone in your group ever on Fox talking about it? I mean, who can do that? I mean, I love when Pete Buttigieg is on Fox because he always, he always puts them in their place. But um, I, I just feel like how do we go to where those folks are and, and impress upon them the fact there were 60 courts that found, you know, none of these election fraud claims were provable. I mean, how do we do that? Um, I guess I get outside the bubble of lawyers who think like we do. Any thoughts? <laughs> or is that a crazy question? I'll start with that one. Um, there's actually some really promising polling uh, that came out uh, sometime in the last two months um, saying that the January 6th commission's work um, really influenced uh, kind of on the bubble voters. That folks who did not see January 6th as a threat to our democracy before the um, before the hearings actually came to see it as a threat to our democracy after. Now, 44% of the population on each side, right, has made up its mind. But turns out there are still folks on the bubble um, and uh, who were interested in learning, and um, and there was some success. So I think some of it is about finding those voices that are. Uh, respected by uh, by folks who are um, maybe you know in different bubbles than the one I occupy, for example. Um, and that's something that protect democracy works really hard to do. We work, you know. Now you mentioned we work, you know, we're a nonpartisan organization. We work with a lot of folks who either still identify as Republicans or really identify as Republicans um, uh, to um, and who really see some of the threats and, and want to speak out and, and ensure their legacy. We like to see that. Yeah. Exactly. And um, I would just add, so when you had asked about the democracy commitment earlier, and I hope all of you will go on LDAD.org and just sign on to the democracy commitment, one of the things that, w the reason why we created that is just to reinforce the message that a, a lot of this is local and community-based and, and regionally-based and state-based. 
um, in, in, in terms of how many bar associations or organ, local organizations you know, pair with you know, civic leaders or community leaders or business leaders and, and produce forums and debates and conversation. I mean, we've really lost the art of civil discourse in our communities. And that's more local, I think, than it is national. Sure, it does help when you can go on, you know, have your voice be heard on, um, in other, you know, in a Fox News, whatever it is. But, um, but I think so much more of that is regional and community based, and being able to create the dialogues and to show people how it's done. Lawyers can, you know, should be great at being able to create community, have community forums where people are having civil conversations about very tough issues, and that mirrors for others how to do that. Uh, good morning, Jose Anderson, University of Baltimore Law School. Um, uh, I guess I have always been troubled watching what happened uh, going back to um, the 2016 uh, uh, change of power. And my students would often ask me, uh, what is this, the role of the lawyers? And um, looking at the profession rather than, say, looking at President Trump, Clearly, uh, he understood what lawyers were for. He's used thousands of lawyers. Maybe he didn't understand that they didn't work for him, they worked for the government. But I think if you look levels deep, and even as we're revealing more information about uh, sort of how he routinely did things that now we're looking at, there, there's a deeper question about the responsibility of lawyers sort of across the board you know, in the, the, the transactions that we fashion for clients, how we deal with the difficult clients that are unwilling to listen and maybe we endorse that and there's some idea that, you know, the title attorney and counselor at law, right, both parts. Uh, do we need a reassessment or a reset of what that means and is it, um, you know, what's the strategy going for with that? Because I'm not, I'm, 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 I was, I'm troubled by the fact that it's not a misunderstanding of what we do, it's how we have gone about what we do, and maybe that, a lot of that has been revealed uh, over you know, this difficult test for democracy. So I'd just be interested in any broader thoughts going forward that you all had about that. Well, just a few quick things come to mind. I mean, that we could spend a, a, another hour on that, on that question alone. It's a very thoughtful question. Um, it's not so much a reassess. I mean, I think we need to re-engage with what our oath is as attorneys. Um, we all took an oath. What, it, what does that oath mean? How many can even today know or remember what words were in that oath? Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> Your Honor. Um, but we took that. We took. We all took that oath. And so, what does that mean? And when we teach, um, I remember as a bar pre uh, when I was bar president. Helping to create with Boston College Law School, which was uh, my alma mater. You might pick that up on occasion from the accident. Um, but uh, we created a special orientation ethics program to, to look at real life ethical problems that come up that lawyers are likely to face because ethics, professional ethics as a uh, you know, as a course has now become, you know, it's, 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 it, it's dry. It doesn't speak to what people really face in the practice of law or in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and it, it's not really accessible. So to me, the part of the answer to your question is how do we make lawyer ethics and our oath accessible to lawyers in a more meaningful basis and particularly to law students? That's just a one set of quick thoughts. Uh, I'll agree wholeheartedly and pick up on that, that having, having and modeling the vocabulary um, and then uh, publicly talking about where lines are and when they've been crossed and um, pointing out role models um, I, is extraordinarily important both in terms of in, in courses and, and in the practice um, through, through mentorship. Um, we have that vocabulary around certain types of discrimination in the workplace, for example. We don't necessarily have it in terms of acting ethically in the workplace. Mm -hmm. 